Joel Schwartzberg, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much, John. It's my uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm so excited to have a nice conversation. You're joining us from New Jersey. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, it was fun just chatting for a few minutes in the pre-interview as we were getting to know each other a little bit and, and touching base. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on communicating authentically as a leader. And of course, this is your area of expertise, something you spend a lot of time on with your clients. Uh, and so I, I imagine you'll have uh, a tremendous amount of insight and good stories and other things to share. And I appreciate you taking time to share that with me and my listeners today. As we get started, I wanted to share Joel's bio with everybody. Joel Schwartzberg is a lead, excuse me, Joel Schwartzberg is a leadership communications coach whose clients include American Express, Blue Cross Blue Shield, State Farm Insurance, and the Brennan Center for Justice and Comedy Central. He is the Senior Director of Strategic and Executive Communications for a major national nonprofit and previously held senior level communication and editorial positions with Time Inc., PBS, Nickelodeon, etc. Schwartzberg's articles on effective communication have appeared in Fast Company, Harvard Business Review, and Toastmaster Magazine. And he's a sought after business and communications podcast guest and conference speaker. And really, I could go on and on and on, Joel. Um, um, but I'll pause there and let you chime in. Is there anything else you would like listeners to know about you, your background, uh, to provide context for the conversation today? Uh, what I'd like to share at this point is really the two biggest aha moments uh, that gave me clarity on how I want to coach people and how they could be more effective. And one was when I finished an 11-year competitive public speaking career that started in sixth grade and ended when I was a senior in college and became a national champion. And then I thought it was over as one might expect from a basketball career or a chess uh, championship. And what happened was as I interviewed for jobs and as I spoke to my managers or my direct reports or spoke at conferences, I was using a lot of the skills that I learned as a public speaking uh, competitor in those settings. Uh, excuse me for a second. I have some cats who are misbehaving. I'll be right back. Apologies. One of the uh, things that happen in Zoom calls, whether it's cats or kids or whatever, it's a live environment. We have to roll with that. <laughs> no so worries. So as I was saying, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so as I was saying, I was using them and I thought to myself, you know, I'd love to share what I learned as a competitor so I could help more people champion their points uh, in any kind of circumstance. If you're interviewing for a job, if you're speaking at a conference, if you're just sharing an idea at a meeting. So that was the first aha moment. The second came about three years into my public speaking training uh, as a coach. I was training people to do all the things you might expect from good public speakers. They were loud, they gestured well, they stood in place. You Google public speaking tips, you'll see all this. But when I asked them for what their point was, they would convey something that was not a point. It was a theme, it was a notion, it was a category, it was a catchphrase, it was a topic but it wasn't an argument, which is what a point is. So that's when I sort of changed the trajectory of all my training, at least and made that the foundation. I wrote a book called Get to the Point in 2017. And then I contextualized the idea of point making and leadership when I wrote The Language of Leadership uh, last year in 2021. That really brings us up to the present. You know, I, um, I work, like you said, uh, as a speechwriter for a nonprofit. So I learn every day. And I love to write. I write for Harvard Business Review and Fast Company and on Twitter all the time. Yeah, I love that. I love uh, the diversity of your background. And I love that context that you you provided for us in terms of uh, where you come from in the, the public speaking space and, and really what you're trying to accomplish now and making your point. That's, that's really interesting because I probably would, if you asked me that same question, I probably would have said something similar to what many of your clients have said in the past. Uh, <laughs> and so that's, that's a good framing for me as well. Um, so we're going to focus in today specifically on communicating authentically as a leader, but perhaps before we get there, um, you've already talked about the importance of making your point and being clear. Um, perhaps you can lay out maybe the top three or four um, just most important things that are essential to being effective in our communication as a leader. Um, and with that, perhaps, you know, th those common pitfalls that people fall into over and over and over again. Right. There are two things that rise, rise to the top. 
And in fact, they inspired me to write uh, the language of leadership. One of which is encountering leaders who start with the wrong question. Uh, the wrong question is, what can I say? What do I want to say? What do I uh, need to say? Uh, this is wrong because it doesn't take the audience, the employees or the teams into account. The right questions are, what does my audience, my teams, my employees, what do they want and need to know? And those are two separate things. What they want to know is something they're probably already aware of, but they want more elaboration. What they need to know is something they may not be aware of, but you need to enlighten them so they understand how they can use that information uh, to elevate the work that they're doing. But in either case, you start with what you want your audience to take away, because what's the point of speaking if your audience is not receiving? Then you work your way backwards to connect what you're going to say with what they want and need to hear. That's how you establish relevance, and there's really no other way to do it. The other important thing is the difference between information and inspiration. Uh, often CEOs don't realize that there are a lot of subject matter experts, there are a lot of executive vice presidents, there are a lot of um, experts who can provide information in a way that they can. Only the CEO, only the leader, or at least the leader in that context, whether they're leading a meeting or leading a committee, people look to them for inspiration. So you need to understand the tools and the mindsets and sometimes even the words uh, that will inspire and engage your team, not simply inform them. You're not a professor, it's not a college setting. So just giving, you know, and we've seen these speeches, here's the background, here are the details, here's how much we're investing, here's how many facilities we're building. That's not inspiring. What is inspiring is all this put together will enable us to increase uh, public health throughout the country, will enable us to sell much more Coca-Cola. Whatever your bottom line is, that's the inspirational part, what this will lead to and how this will impact you and society. Yeah, okay, that's excellent. Those, those points, um, so knowing your audience, knowing what they need and want, uh, and then being able to inspire towards that end goal, right? Right, uh, not just that, inform, but inspire, right. Yeah, get past information. And how many of us have sat through meeting after meeting after meeting? That's just informative. And right. I mean, honestly, you can get that over an email or you can send out a video to people or whatever. Like it's just, it, it almost defeats the, the purpose of even having a meeting in the first place. And so right. if you're getting people together and you're, you know, do you have to have, evidence-based um, arguments to have a conversation around a, a sticky, complex issue? Absolutely. Um, and that's one type of conversation that may happen. Um, but there, there's a whole range of different types of conversations, right? And the right. inspirational to get at the needs and the wants of your people, that's, that's essential. Uh, so that's a really, really good point. And I'm, I'm glad you focused in on that. Right. Okay. It's what they want oh, from a leader. I just want to say that's what they want from a leader. And that should be the real driver. What do people want from you? They want you to provide vision, to inspire, to engage, to show the roadmap and what happens if everyone does their job. Yeah. And I think if you're not doing those things that you just said, you're more of a manager rather than a leader. And, right. and a lot has been said around you know, that difference. And so I don't right. want to rehash that here, but I just want to put a fine point Google on that. that. that yeah. yeah, that it's, it's a, it's a big deal. Like there are so many people who have leadership positions and leadership titles who are just managers and they're just doing exact, they're not doing any of the inspiring, any of the vision or mission um, or values-based kind of conversations. It's just informative. It's just directive. It's just, you know, telling people what to do. That's management that may be logistics. It's not leadership. So right. we need, we, you know, th there's a role for that. There's a time and a place for those things. But if we're talking about leadership, we need to, to move beyond that. I agree. Okay. So let's, let's move into now and talking more specifically about communicating authentically. Now, I, I guess, first of all, what do you mean by authentic um, in, in terms of our communication? If, if, if I'm meeting with my people and I, I know what they need and want, and I have this whole spiel prepared. I know like how to be inspiring. Um, and I believe in what I'm going to say, wh why might I fall into the trap of being inauthentic or how might I fall into the trap of being inauthentic in that kind of a moment? Right. And let's start with, you know, that word, uh, 
authentic or authenticity is a tactic. And we know from marketing that there's a difference between tactics and goals, right? So what is the goal of a, or the strategy of using authenticity? The goal is trust. Uh, you want your team, your employees, your staff to trust you to make decisions because they're not witness to 90% of the decisions uh, you make except for what you express. So how do we build that trust? We build that trust through the conveyance of authenticity. It's not enough for a leader. And this is why I wrote the language of leadership. It's one thing for a leader to feel like they're being authentic or to value authenticity, but what they need to do is communicate uh, authenticity. So how do we do that? We start by what I say, what I call skipping the script. Uh, too often leaders and people in general, to be quite honest, they believe the right way to give a speech is to write a word for word manuscript. And with apologies to speechwriters, uh, because I'm one, uh, people will remember what you meant, not necessarily what you said. They will remember your point, not necessarily your words. So let's start with you don't need to write a word for word uh, script because people won't remember the words. But what it does is it conveys to the audience that you don't need them, that I'm gonna read this to you and maybe I could have emailed it, maybe I could have created a podcast, but I'm not really presenting to you. I don't want to explain things to you. I have a little boilerplate here that I'm gonna to read to you. Uh, reading is a different part of your brain than presenting. It's also received uh, in a different part of the brain than presenting. So if you are reading something that's been prepared weeks ago, you're not really being authentic to the moment because what are people expecting? A live conversation. And I wrote a whole uh, piece about this for Harvard Business Review about some of the perils that can happen when you write a script. Uh, the other thing is say what you believe. Now, a lot of uh, CEOs, they will have speech writing teams and they may have a committee saying, all right, say these words and this is what will match our, you know, our approach or our new campaign. But if a leader or anyone says anything that they would not normally say, they will come across as inauthentic. Uh, Sometimes they, they teach you when you go to speech writing conferences, the trick is not so much writing what someone would say, the trick is making sure you never write something they would never say. Uh, and that's the way you wanna make sure you're authentic. And that's the burden of the leader. Never say anything that you don't mean, always sound like you, rewrite that material if you must. Uh, you're usually coming in with notes, not a script. So you're just reminded through those notes of the things that you want to say or through that PowerPoint or Canva. Uh, then you're using your own experience and your own uh, subject matter knowledge to explain that in a live environment. Uh, two more things, telling stories really elevates uh, authenticity, particularly personal stories. Now, it doesn't mean you have to write, you have to talk about an experience from your childhood uh, that would you know, make for a great TV movie someday. It can be merely the funny thing your six-year-old said that morning, something you heard on NPR, something you read in the newspaper, something you overheard at a conference, anything that's true to your experience that you're using not just to entertain, uh, but to connect to relevance and make through which you make your point that will also increase your authenticity. And one other um, very important thing to realize is that perfectionism is the opposite of authenticity. Sometimes public speakers and particularly leaders think, oh, I wanna be remembered as a great public speaker, so I don't wanna make any mistakes. Uh, that is not the goal, that is not the measuring stick. And often, if you cough, if you make a mistake, if you correct yourself, uh, if you have a moment where you need to collect your thoughts. Instead of losing points for perfection, you're actually gaining points for being real and authentic. Yeah, th those are all really, really great points. And I couldn't help but think about uh, TED Talks, for example. So I would love to pick your brain a little bit because I know, you know, when someone is going to give a TED Talk or at a TEDx event, they often are coached um, by event coordinators on preparation for that event which often in involves writing a script and practicing and rehearsing that script extensively um, and all of those things. Yet my experience is similar to what you just articulated that I need to have clear in my mind key points that I wanna make, key elements that I wanna include. Um, I need to have a general scaffolding in my mind, right. but 
but I, I don't want to be over prescriptive in how I'm communicating in the moment. And I need to be comfortable enough with the material that I can just speak from the heart in the moment. Um, right. that, se that seems at odds with, for example, what you would get from a, a TEDx coach oftentimes, or perhaps other, you know, speech writers or other uh, public speaking gurus, uh, like you mentioned. Right. If you Google the TED commandments, there's actually this list. And I think number eight is thou shalt not read thy speech. Uh, <laughs> and I think in various TEDx uh, environments, some of them, um, perhaps even most of them will have you write it out. But the key is not the writing or memorization. The key is the practice over and over and over again. And the truth is, if you practice something so often that it's literally memorized, uh, there are lots of things you can do if you have that ability to make it seem more spontaneous. But easier to me is, like you said, go in with the points, the roadmap of what you want to say. Make sure you hit those points. And if you're speaking naturally, which you will have to if you're not fully scripted, uh, then you will come across as truly authentic and make that kind of impact you're looking to make uh, with an audience, whether it's a TED Talk or whether you're talking at a town hall to your 1,000, 500, 10,000 employees. Yeah, and so that means you might make a misstep. You might say something wrong and have to correct yourself. You might have to clear your throat. You might say ums or other filler yeah, you words. Yeah, might say an um or ah here or there. <laughs> and it's okay. And ultimately, that's not the big deal because what you're focused on is the impact of your words rather than the, the perfection of the delivery of your words, if I'm hearing right. you correctly. And let me, um, you know, something I said in that article, imagine you went to your friend and you said, oh, you saw the latest Spider-Man movie. Did you like it? And the friend says, hold on, I'm going to run home. I'm going to type up a 300 word review. I'm going to print it out and I'm going to bring it to you. And then I'll hand it to you and you can read it. That's ridiculous, right? Yet that's what we're sometimes expecting or what people expect from themselves when they write out a word for word. Uh, speech. It's not what people want. Now, caveat to my friends uh, who are speech writers, sometimes CEOs or politicians, uh, they have screens and they have teleprompters, and it's okay to have a manuscript there. The key thing, like I said, is practice. And one thing I, I definitely want to leave your audience with, John, is there's bad practice and there's good practice. Bad practice looks like this. Uh, yeah, 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 and then 10% of the goals. Uh, okay, I'm good. That's bad practice because you're not practicing what you're gonna be doing. Uh, what you're gonna be doing is having your mind and your mouth work together to make points. That is only practice for your head. So the only good practice is practice out loud in real time. If you really wanna make sure your practice is worth something and you're prepared, practice out loud. Now you don't need a video camera. I don't recommend mirrors. You don't need someone uh, on your team. Uh, just take a walk. Go into your bathroom, go into your closet, whatever it takes, but say it out loud. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really appreciate the, the focus that you made also on vulnerability. So being open and vulnerable, whether that's sharing something from your personal life, you know, be appropriately vulnerable. You don't want to overshare or make your, your audience uncomfortable <laughs> because you're right. sharing too much. But, you know, sharing a little bit... Uh, of, of your real messy life with people can go a long way in developing the trust. And when I think about communicating with impact, I think trust is at the core. I mean, so much of leadership is about trust. And so right. if you want people to follow you, you want to inspire people, it has to be built upon a foundation of mutual accountability and trust where people know that you genuinely care about them and that you're being authentic and real with them. So that involves vulnerability, but ultimately that's going to be built upon the foundation of trust. And right. so we just need to reinforce that over and over and over again. And we need to think about what are we saying? Is it consistent with, with what we actually think and believe, what the data actually says? We're not twisting the data to try to make the point we want to get across, but we're actually being true to it. We're not gaslighting. We're not right. pretending like it is the way it is now. And it's right, always been that way. Spinning something, right, right. Yeah, no spin, no gaslighting. Just be real. And that means sometimes we have to apologize. Sometimes we have to acknowledge yeah. mistakes. And you know what? When you do that, when you communicate authentically in that way, uh, sometimes people worry, well, you're being too vulnerable. It shows weakness. People are going to pounce on that weakness. I, I suppose there, there, there are circumstances where that could happen. And depending on the makeup of your of your team, I suppose there could be individuals on your team that might want to pounce. 
But if you have a good team with good relationships where you trust each other, uh, all you're doing is reinforcing the trust and you're giving them permission to do the same thing. You're giving them permission to acknowledge setbacks and mistakes, to be able to course correct and to be able to move forward and not get caught up and, and hung up with you know any of the the missteps that you may have made. And that's right. what we that's what we need if we want innovative, creative organizations and teams and we want people to iterate and con- and continually be learning. We can't have a, this this psychologically unsafe, fearful environment where people feel like they can only put on a brave face, they can only have their facade and pretend like everything's fine. And if they ever say anything negative to the boss, then they're going to get lashed out against and blah, blah, blah. Like all of that, that's just a toxic environment. That's not what we want in our teams. Right. And we're human beings. We don't say that often enough. And you think about, well, what inspires me about another human being? Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's a a public figure. It's their humanness uh, and the humanness that powers their conveyance and their communications. Now, let's not uh, conflict, or let's not uh, associate uh, auth- um, and vulnerability with powerlessness or uh, apologies. There are ways uh, you could still be powerful and authentic, and that's what you want to do. For example, if you're sharing bad news, you don't want to focus so much on the challenge. You want to focus on the solution. And you can say, yes, we're working this out. Um, there are a lot of challenges in the road but this is how we're going to overcome them. So always speak with power and conviction. That's what I say, but be human, be vulnerable at the same time. And let's put it in this category of imperfection. Don't be afraid to be imperfect, but be the leader who is inspiring, who is talking about how to get out of it. A metaphor I sometimes say is you're a captain on a boat that's taking on water. Uh, does the people on the boat, do they want the leader or the captain to talk about how much water is coming in, or how many buckets <laughs> we're going to need to get the water out? Uh, no, we want the leader to say, if not, this is how we're going to get to dry land. Here's what I'm going to do to put those uh, steps in place. And one of the, the language of leadership is a lot about words. And one of the words I come back to is rest assured, rest assured. Uh, they're among the magic words uh, that a leader can use to trigger and to um, imply that there's a plan in place to get us out of this mess or to elevate us to the next level. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And I couldn't help but reflect, as we've been having this conversation, I've been thinking about some of the, the public speaking types of environments I've been in. And definitely my style, my comfort zone has always been, you know, have the scaffolding, have the, the bullet right. points and, and go in prepared and knowledgeable on the topic. So, and then just speak from the heart in the moment, but there have been, I mean, honestly, I can only think of a couple experiences and examples where I actually wrote out word for word, what I wanted to say. And in those moments, um, I, I think it was even appropriate because it was such a different kind of an atmosphere and environment with a different audience that I wasn't used to, um, speaking about an incredibly sensitive topic, Um, where, and I had a a built into what I was speaking about. There was a tremendous amount of vulnerability built in. And frankly, I wasn't sure emotionally I was going to be able to get through it, (laughs) um, unless I just had it all written out. And so I, and I, even as I started speaking, I said, you know, I'm sorry, this is not something I normally do, but I've prepared written remarks. I'm going to read these to you. And it was very well received. Uh, sure. from the audience. And so there are time, there is a time and place where you can do those things and that's fine. Um, it, you just don't want to fall back on that uh, all the time. Right. And, you know, it comes back to audience. If you were speaking internally, which for most of my CEO clients, they give more internal speeches than external conference keynotes. Uh, your audience of employees and your teams, they want you to be real and human and authentic. And that's where it matters most to have a list of bullet points, a scaffolding and to deliver it live. But I have other CEOs or even sometimes the same CEOs who speak to an audience where we want them to get out their checkbooks. Uh, We want to inspire them. We want a soaring speech, almost a political speech. There are teleprompters. And that's where sometimes the words do matter because uh, people want to be inspired in a way that gets them behind Uh, an entire focus, an entire mission. So I've done it both ways. And there's actually a hybrid also. I work with one CEO 
who is really good at making spontaneous decisions. And what I do is I write out a complete spe speech and then I bullet the entire speech. So they can go bullet by bullet. And with each bullet, that CEO says to themselves, read or riff. And they can literally decide to read that bullet as it was, perfect. Or they can riff on it because they have a little more insight and they know they have the, the background or the baseline of knowledge to speak on it. But they could do that moment by moment, bullet by bullet. And I find that hybrid a really good tool for a lot of leaders when they want to say, well, I'm concerned about the transition from this to this. So I'm just going to read that as you wrote it. But this section right here, I know all about that and I feel passionate about it. I'm going to riff on that. Yeah, excellent. Well, Joel, it has been a real pleasure. I appreciate all of the, the tips, all of the uh, the experiences and, and the advice that you've provided me and my listeners today. Before we close, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. You know, the IT people in the audience is always like when I use this term, I like my, uh, my approach is open code. Uh, that is, I like to share as many ideas as I can, as freely as I can, whether it's on a podcast or in an article I write. Uh, and then the books are the best place to sort of uh, get them and they're short books, so they're easy reads. And the best place that people can find all those resources is through my website, which is www.joelschwartzberg.net, J-O-E-L-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z-B-E-R-G. Thank you to my parents for that long last name. Uh, dot net. Another place where I really encourage people to uh, get in touch with me or to receive uh, my ideas is on Twitter. And I'm on Twitter at the Joel Truth, the Joel Truth on Twitter. And I'm sharing lots of ideas all the time about all these things. And the bottom line to all of this, all of my books, all my writing, all my training is that if you don't come at your communication opportunity with a point, you will be rendered pointless. And it doesn't matter if you're a CEO who's been giving speeches for years, or you just graduated from college and are just starting an internship. It's not about how much experience you have. Uh, it's not about how high your level is. Presentation ability is a skill. It is not a talent. You're not born with it. So everyone, no matter what your level, needs to know your point, sharpen that point, champion that point. I love it. Thank you, Joel. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Joel and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thank you, John. And thank you to your audience.